Making sense of the statements that John Mosellock made that has some Cardinals fans already looking for their torches and are ready to storm the gates over at Ballpark Village. Let's get into it today on Locked On Cardinals. You are Locked On Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans. I'm J.D. Hatford, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou with a lifetime Cardinals fan, and I'm your host for Locked On Cardinals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter X at J.D. Sports Radio. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter X at LO underscore Cardinals. We do want to thank those of you who make Locked On Cardinals your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us on YouTube if you haven't done that yet. I uh, would love to love to see you on there. Uh, I believe we're at 7,900 subscribers. We're getting there, guys. We are getting there. Getting close to 8,000, which is where I wanted to be before the end of the year. So uh, if you have a moment, would appreciate it if you could just go ahead and like and subscribe. That way you're interacting with us. Uh, feel free to hit that notification button so you know when the new episodes are posted. This is a show serving Cardinal Nation and giving the best fans in baseball all of the info about the birds on the bat. This offseason, do I have to say this out loud? This offseason is huge. It's a big one for President of Baseball Operations, John Mozeliak and the St. Louis Cardinals for a number of different reasons. After the catastrophe that was the 2023 season, everybody just wants to know exactly how they're going to fix this, right? That's what you want to know. You want to know what Mo's plans are and what they're going to do with this roster moving forward. How are they going to fix this? How are you going to turn? a team that won a division, you turn them into a last place team, and how are you going to get them back up, right? That's what we want to know. Unfortunately, for us as fans, um, John Mosellock doesn't really doesn't really tell you what's going on, you know, all that often. You know, he's, he, the policy for the team is really to not comment on anything that's going on. He has said this repeatedly during the trade deadline. He said it in multiple off seasons where he just doesn't comment on specific people. He just doesn't do it. Uh, they do all that stuff behind closed doors. They aren't one to get rumor mills flying. Obviously, we get information that gets leaked somehow, some way from other people in the organization. But rarely does Mo give us a straightforward answer on what he's planning to do. He kind of, he'll leave you a few breadcrumbs, right? You know, like, hey, well, you know, three pitchers is what we need. He, so you know he's going in that direction. Didn't take a genius to know that. Um, but he lets our imaginations kind of do the rest. And sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we don't. Like last year when he made the statement the payroll was going up, I, I'm one of the first to admit it. I was the one who took that as, okay, they're going to add a significant free agent other than at the catching position. We knew they were going to get a catcher at some way, somehow, whether it was trade or free agency. And then I thought that meant at least one more piece was going to get added. And I was completely wrong. They didn't do that. Uh, that didn't happen. So when we we get into these quotes today uh, from Mo, I'm, I'm telling you, for me, I'm going to keep an open mind on what he means. I'm going to stay level-headed. Uh, I'm just going to try not to freak out. <laughs> and I suggest you do the same for your own sanity. OK, it's just it, it will benefit you to not freak out. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm at the meetings in Arizona. I am not. <laughs> Clearly, I'm at home. Um, I'm not the one asking Mo these questions that you're going to get answers to. All we can do is go off of the reporting that we're getting from the people who are in Arizona at the GM meetings. Uh, the guys that I really like to go to, they're my dudes. MLB.com's John Denton, Derek Gould from STLToday.com. OK, those are the guys that I, I tend to trust the most when it comes to any of the reporting. Not that anybody else is a bad reporter. That's not what I'm saying. You know, I like Katie Wu from The Athletic. I mean, there are plenty of them to go around. Jeff Jones is another one. Obviously, Daniel Guerrero, as far as prospect talks at STLToday.com. But uh, the guys that I'm following a lot when it comes to these meetings right now, Denton and Gould. So I'm going to take quotes from Mo from their work. OK, OK. 
Uh, I'm going to link their work in the description, in the show notes, so that you can take a look at the full stories at your convenience. But um, I'm here to break this stuff down for you guys and make it easier for you. So uh, Mosellock spoke to a group of media on Monday. And he gave some information on things that are that are going on with the team and what some of the plans are moving forward. And I've got a few of the tidbits here for you. Uh, and there's one that in particular got some fans worked up. OK, so uh, first and foremost, on whether or not he's feeling pressure going into the season. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of a silly question. <laughs> Obviously, he is. But his quote is, I certainly feel pressure. I think the expectations are high and people want to get back to that. These are demanding jobs, and when they don't go as planned, whether it's self-induced pressure or outside pressure, regardless, you feel pressure. I'm not approaching this offseason on a personal level to worry about legacy or how I'm remembered. I certainly understand this past year did not go like any of us had planned. And so the great thing about sports is that you can hit the reset button and try to get it more right. And I feel like Mo has been very open about this, basically since the trade deadline this year, that they made some decisions that did not work, clearly. They acknowledge that. They know they made some F ups, if you will. And uh and are they're not gonna be like, oh golly gee, no big deal. They, they seem to be taking accountability for it. They want to win, obviously. The the question is how aggressive will they be with their finances to turn this thing around sooner rather than later. Now, on what moves might be made this offseason, Derek Gold at stltoday.com wrote that Mo preferred to wait to talk about the moves that could be while declining to identify specific targets by name. He outlined how the Cardinals have used their head start on the off season to workshop and map several scenarios they'll pursue to reimagine their rotation and augment the bullpen. One of the quotes from Mo in his story says, I do think we understand what we're trying to get this off season. We know we need innings. We know we need to revamp our starting pitching. You listen around the league and everybody is trying to do that. It's going to be a very competitive marketplace and hopefully we are able to come out of this on the right side. Let me stop right there because <laughs> I know that that particular statement is going to get fans worked up already because it's a very mo thing to, to say, which many people hate because it kind of gives him the excuse to say, well, hey, you know, we tried. We tried to sign guys to get better, but it just didn't work out. And we don't want to hear that. You know, you you don't want to hear that anymore. And I understand that. Uh, Mo also added that it is a little bit of a, a little bit of a volume game on our end. We know we need more than just one, which we are all aware of, right? We we know that they need more than one pitcher. You know, the Cardinals are in that predicament where they've got money to spend. That's not the issue, but it's not unlimited money. It's not New York Mets money. You're not going to see a three hundred twenty six million dollar payroll this year that's not going to happen they've got a lot of holes to fill they got a budget that they want to stick to so how are they going to go about this uh if they only needed one pitcher they could go out and just blow the lot on a yamamoto if they wanted to but that's not where they are uh gould writes if there is a pitcher available free agent or trade the Cardinals would like to have a conversation. They do have their preferences and they have a competitive amount to spend. The strategy will be in how they carve up that payroll pie and who wants a slice. Uh, two of the pitchers the Cardinals plan to pursue, Billy A. Serenola and Japanese star Yoshinobu Yamamoto, would take a considerable nine-figure cut of that available spending and influence how the Cardinals shop for other starters. Sonny Gray, a veteran right-hander on whom the Cardinals plan to make a bid, would fit into a variety of their scenarios. A one-year offer to a bounce-back candidate has an appeal if the Cardinals get two surefire starters. Now, that last part there from Gould just screams Lucas Giolito, right? Done it? I mean, I'm sure there's other guys that fall under that category. And, uh, you know, I've seen some fans who think that Lance Lynn is somebody they should give another chance to. Personally, I, I don't want to go there. I don't, I don't want Lance Lynn. I, I don't, I don't want to go somebody that old and declining. I, I don't need to do that. Nothing against Lance Lynn because I wish I could have his attitude. I wish that his personality, all of that, because I love the dude, would be awesome in this clubhouse. I think it would be great. But I don't know if the guy has anything physically to offer anymore. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But more times than not, when I would turn a game on this past year, he's doing this. 
looking over his shoulder as somebody hits a dinger off him. And he was handing out dingers like they were like breadsticks at the Olive Garden or something. But uh, we got more for Mo to talk about. Like, There's a lot to get to here, but we got to take a break real quick. On the other side, I'll tell you what he said about the payroll. That is what got everybody worked up about. And also what he had to say about Yadier Molina. Some, uh, some, some good news there about him possibly joining the staff. So we'll, we'll get into all of that here on Locked on Cardinals. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Again, if your team wins, here's what you do. Like any, so $5, okay? $5 money line bet. Five bucks. Like a coffee is really what that's going to cost you. Like a, like a grande coffee. Five bucks. You bet. You win. They throw in another 150 bucks for you. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, the app, very easy to use. Wide range of betting options, including the spreads, the player props, the over-unders, and a whole lot more. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, really no better time to get in on the action. Uh, Jets looked terrible on offense last night, so sorry if anyone took them against the Chargers. Some bad advice by me. My apologies. I didn't know they were going to stink the bed like that. Uh, even the other bet that I thought would hit, I had a, an anytime TD by Brees Hall. That fell flat. Every time he had a good run, there's a holding call or something. Just an ugly game all around. So if you're betting on the Jets to do anything, my condolences. Not good. But new slate of NFL games are going to start on Thursday night. Not the greatest game ever <laughs> on Thursday. Carolina at Chicago. Carolina 1-7. and seven, Bears 2-7. and seven. Ironic thing about this is that the Carolina Panthers actually traded this year's first-round pick to the Bears so they could move up in this last draft. And that's how they took... Uh, uh, their quarterback, Bryce Young. And so now the Bears have two of the top five picks in the draft at the moment. It would actually be better for them to probably, I don't know, if it's better to lose or win this. I don't know. Either way, um, they supposedly have Justin Fields coming back at quarterback this week. Bears favored by three and a half uh, right now on FanDuel. But these are the games that you place bets on to make them more entertaining. Because do you really want to watch Carolina, Chicago? Probably not unless you're a fan of those teams, but you make some prop, prop bets and it makes it way more entertaining. I can promise you that. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, kick off the NFL season with FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Once again, thank you for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. If you would like to leave comments, you can do that on YouTube as well as on Twitter, X, anytime you want. Feedback always welcome and encouraged. Uh, so back to what John Mozeliak was saying on Monday. Uh, again, these are coming from Derek Gould at stltoday.com. Uh, I'll have the link in the description below and in the show notes for you so you can read the entire article because I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm just giving you some of the more entertaining points that uh, he brought up and what Mo said. So uh, as far as on Yadier Molina possibly joining the staff in some capacity this year, Gould says the Cardinals and their catching great remain in ongoing conversations about his return to the team in a coaching role. They are still discussing the specific role, the time commitment, and the responsibilities, and those talks aren't likely to be finalized this week. Now, according to Mosellock, nothing is set in stone yet. I'm hopeful that he will be a part of our organization at some point next year. So, my opinion, that's great news. I don't know, honestly, a single person who thinks that Yachty coming back to the team to help out is a bad idea. I, I have voiced my concerns on how manager Ali Marmel might feel about this uh, and how that could be an awkward spot for him. But I, I think everybody would love to see Yachty back in the fold, back in a uniform, back in the clubhouse, in that dugout on a regular basis, helping guys like Wilson Contreras and Yvonne Herrera and Andrew Kisner, helping the pitchers, even the new ones that come in. You know, I mean, his knowledge is, you know, off the charts. So uh, how that can be a bad thing, way smaller than the positives that could come from Yanni or Molina coming back. Uh, speaking of Ali and his staff, Derek Gould said, all of the Cardinals coaches from manager Oliver Marmol's staff remain under contract for 2024. And as of Monday, all were expected back. Rose Alock said he does expect the size of the staff to grow. Again, we know that they cut staff when COVID happened. They never really fully restocked things. So perhaps that's what he means by this. Who are these people? 
We aren't sure yet. We don't really know. But clearly, Yachty is someone that they're looking at. Uh, Jason Isringhausen was around last year. They tried to get Matt Holiday to come back and coach. So it's not like they're not reaching out to people uh, to see if they would want to be a part of things. So where that goes from here, we don't know yet. But it looks like they're going to bring in extra voices, extra extra brains to help this whole thing. Uh, Gould also mentioned that Mosellock has met with at least two executives recently let go from other teams in hopes of bringing in an advisor who can give the Cardinals an outsider's perspective. And although Mo didn't name anyone specifically, Gould said that the team has been in contact with Heim Bloom, who was the former GM with the Boston Red Sox, just got let go, uh, was also with Tampa Bay, who we all know runs a very nice organization down in Southern Miami. So, um, or Southern, uh, or down in Florida, Southern United States, not Southern Miami. I don't make any sense. Um, but about an advisor role with Heim Bloom. So um, I find that to be very fascinating because to me, it shows a bit of a, a, a vulnerability for the Cardinals, uh, their front office that, you know, they're, they're kind of like, look, we don't have all the answers right now. And maybe we need a little kick in the pants and a bit of a, a refresh on, on how things are done. Um, you know, they're not going to just flip things over and do everything completely different, but to get some outside perspective is very nice from time to time in the radio industry where I, where I'm from, uh, we call those air checks. You know, you get your PD or your MD, they come in, they take a listen to your show and just kind of, it just gives some fresh ears on what you do. And, they kind of tell you what what they think is good and bad and what can be improved on just in their opinion. It doesn't mean you have to do exactly what they say, but it's nice to get that feedback. And it's a good thing as long as you're okay with taking constructive criticism. Because if you don't like anybody telling you that you're not you know, doing everything right, then it's not going to work out so well. Um, so now we are where he starts talking about payroll. All right, and here's where people got bent out of shape a bit online. Um, I'm just going to give you exactly what Gould writes here so that I don't screw it up because you're dealing with numbers here. But here's what Derek Gould's got written, stltoday.com. In the final internal accounting, the Cardinals did not eclipse $200 million in total spending on their 40-man roster for the first time in club history. They fell shy because of the salaries moved at the trade deadline. Mosellock said he expects this year's payroll to return to last year's trend, which would put a 40-man budget just above that $200 million milestone. That gives them flexibility to go shopping. The Cardinals have an estimated $145 million committed for 2024 when players do raises through their existing contracts or arbitration are included. Now here's the quote from Mo. And this is where everybody started getting upset. <laughs> Uh, the economics of our game are changing and there's still uncertainty with TV rights and there's probably going to be some volatility in our overall ticket sales. We have to be prudent in how we think through some of this. I definitely think the type of payroll we were going to have last year is going to look very similar this year. Now, from what I'm gathering online is that people are taking that statement and in their minds they're saying that the payroll they had last year is where the team is staying this year so in their minds that means that it's not going up and that the cardinals aren't going to sign any major free agents and they're going to be shopping in the mid to bottom tier area of free agents and will be uh it will be bad again. They're going to suck again because they're not going to go get these big names we've been talking about, the Yamamoto's, the Nola's, the Blake Snell's. Instead, they're going to be down here shopping. And to help make sense of this whole financial side of this, I'm going to defer to what MLB.com's John Denton wrote. And I'm going to give you those statements next because he breaks it down to give you actual numbers of like, all right, here's what they're working with. All right, so I'm going to give those numbers to you next on Locked on Cardinals. All right, so back to the payroll. Admittedly, I am no mathematician, 
past geometry and I guess algebra two. I don't, I don't really remember much about the math courses that I took in college. So when it comes to payroll stuff, um, you know, I can handle the basic numbers. Two years, $12 million, I can handle that stuff. But I'd rather just take it from one of the pros on this one, okay? So um, so I don't steer anyone wrong here. Uh, you know, I don't want to put you in the wrong direction and say something that's wrong. So I'm just going to go with what the pros say on this one. In regards to Mo's comments, again, here's what Mo said. We have to be prudent in how we think through some of this. I definitely think the type of payroll we have or we were going to have last year is going to look very similar this year. Again, people think that means that they're not spending money, they're staying where they were, and we're screwed. Here's how John Denton broke it down. Quote, I totally understand why no Cardinals fan wants to hear the words very similar following an awful 2023 such as President of Baseball Operations John Mozeliak saying that the 2024 payroll will look very similar to the 2023 projections. But here is the thing. The Cardinals 2023 payroll was projected to possibly approach $200 million, which would have been the highest in team history. It actually ended up between $173 and $187 million, depending on the source, after trading five pitchers and not adding reinforcements at the MLB trade deadline. They have approximately $44 million in salary coming off the books and have approximately $143 million committed with arbitration raises factored in, which is a big deal. Because if you go look at like Spot Track right now or Spot Rack, however you want to say it, uh, if you go there to their website and you see a certain number where the arbitration numbers aren't added yet, it looks much lower. Then continues, if the 2024 payroll gets up to $200 million, as 2023's was projected to do, that leaves $57 million to spend to bolster the starting staff and bullpen. Mosellock repeatedly mentioned volume, as in the Cardinals <clears throat> need lots of arms to cover all the innings ahead. While they might not be able to lay on the top end free agent pitchers, two in the next tier, along with two relievers, might serve them best. Trades are also an important option. All right. So this is where everybody got upset. Twitter X, people are just ready to, to go after Mosaic after this because it makes it sound as if the Cardinals are being cheap again. And honestly, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that's what, what the case is here. But they have to figure out what is the best way to spend that money to fill these spots because there's a bunch of them and you want to fill them with the, the highest quality. You know, do you want one ace? You could go grab one ace, right? But then if you have, if you have to get that guy, do you have to get two below average pitchers to fill two of these holes? Doesn't really do you a lot of good. You know, you want to have a balance there for the overall level of the staff to rise to where we want it to be. So if we take this $57 million number that Denton's talking about in that article, actually on Twitter, it wasn't even an article. It was on Twitter that he posted that. So say, and I'm just going to give you some scenarios here. Say you're able to land Yamamoto and Sonny Gray, which I think everybody would be quite happy with. And we're going to use the Jim Bowden from the athletic guesstimates on the contracts here. So he had Yamamoto at seven years, $211 million. Okay. So that's, what, 30 million a year? Great was three years at 64, which is like 21 million a year. That's 51 million of your 57. Okay. And if you're still wanting to grab another pitcher and some bullpen pieces, you see what the dilemma would be there if you got those two starters. Then people are going to get upset because, you know, Matthew Libertor now has to be in your starting rotation and people weren't overall thrilled with everything that he brought to the table last year. So now if you come down from the Yamamoto tier, all right, which is the number one tier, Blake Snell, I'm going to say he's still in that top tier, but he's not Yamamoto money. He's a little bit lower according to the, the Jim Bowden guesstimate. So he's five years, 122. So you're at 24 and a half million. And then if you add gray as well, you're at 45 and a half million, which does leave you, enough money for a guy like a Seth Lugo, a guy that I've become kind of a fan of, kind of a proponent of, bringing him in 
two years, 20 million. And then you have a little bit left over for the bullpen. Not a lot, but you've got some. And then maybe you do what I'm hoping they do is that some of these young arms that you think might be starters later on down the road can help you in the bullpen this year. That's another way to look at it. Or, as Denton mentions at, in the, at the very end there, you go and you drop down another tier. And you don't get anybody. You don't get a Nola. You don't get Yamamoto. You don't go Nola. You don't go Snell. You don't go Jordan Montgomery. You come down to another tier. And you do something like Michael Waka. Two years, 32 million, which is 16 per. Lucas Giolito. Two years, 24, which is about, it was 12 million. That's filling up two holes for 28 million. Then you trade for another guy, say a Dylan Cease, who was estimated to make for arbitration this year at uh, 8.3 million, according to Spot Rack. That gets you to 36.3 million, which still gives you plenty of room for other signings, like say a Matsui from Japan, the reliever. Plus, you're also getting rid of some contracts that you traded away to get Cease. Now you've got a lot of flexibility there where you can upgrade other areas and you have room for later on down the road. Um, as far as trades, you can do the same with Tyler Glass now from the Tampa Bay Rays, although his contract's at $25 million, which is pretty hefty. But again, you're trading away contracts, so it, it could work out that way. The point I'm trying to make here is there are different ways to go about this. The real trick is, first off, you got to convince these guys to come to St. Louis amid a rebuild kind of retool season. Second, you got to trade away guys that make sense for your roster and that isn't going to do so much damage to your roster construction already that did kind of work last year. You know, I'm talking about guys like Donovan and Edmund, uh, Burleson, Kisner, Libertor, Thompson. You pair one or two of those guys up with O'Neal, Dylan Carlson, to go get a starter who is more financially acceptable at this point, but is still going to give you those innings and the production you want. It's like a big puzzle, you know? And you just got to figure out how to make the pieces all fit. And you don't want one piece being so large of the puzzle that if that breaks down, you're kind of screwed. So I think my homework assignment for you guys, I want you to post down below or send on Twitter X your combination of guys that you would want within that $57 million spending cap. Just stick with starters because bullpen numbers, we're not totally sure what that's going to be. They're tougher to gauge at the moment, but stick with those numbers. See what kind of combinations you guys can come up with to get the Cardinals a staff that you would believe in for next year. That you'd be like, you know what? I'm okay with these five. And I understand why people don't trust the front office. I understand that. You know, they don't think they're going to do absolutely everything that is needed to turn this around and secure a winner for next year. I mean, I don't blame you for feeling that way. This is not a knock on you for, for being that way and feeling like you don't trust Mo at the moment. But personally, I'm just choosing to kind of let things play out a bit before I start getting all worked up <laughs> about everything because we're not even remotely there yet, okay? So that's your assignment. Would love to hear from you. Let me know what you got. Thanks for making Lockdown Cardinals first listen every day. And if you haven't already, do us a favor. Give us a follow on Twitter, X. LO underscore Cardinals and JD Sports Radio. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. Help our channel and our love for the Cardinals grow. You guys are the best fans in baseball for a reason, and I'll see you next time on Locked on Cardinals. Have a good one.